Liar. Everywhere. On NetRootsRadio.com. David Waldman. Kagra. In the morning. Now, here's David Waldman. Hey, good morning, everybody. How you doing? It is Wednesday, December 27th, 2023. Time for an actual live new show. We're back during the uh, holiday week, some of the shortest days of the year. Latest sunrise of the year for us here in, uh, what would you call this, the mid-Atlantic region, perhaps? Uh, But at any rate, uh, yes, we discovered that in reading scientific articles the other day, that uh, today's the latest sunrise, though the solstice passed a few days ago. So, I don't know. Made no real difference to me. But hey, uh, hey, you want to know an interesting story? Yesterday, as you may have noticed, we were off the air again uh, for Boxing Day. I know you, you, everybody wanted time for Boxing Day not to be distracted with stories about uh, the constitutionality of Trump's candidacy, et cetera, et cetera. And they needed to concentrate on their boxing, whatever that might be. I actually do remember having looked that up at one point and figuring out what Boxing Day actually was. But uh, at any rate, uh, yesterday I uh, we were off the air traveling and just visiting for the holidays in general, so no emergency or anything. But uh, how do you like this? I thought that we had decided, or maybe we decided it off the air during a break or something like that, that uh, this pa- yesterday, Tuesday, that Joan... McCarter was definitely going to be busy with holiday stuff and not able to stop by yesterday. But I set up the computer this morning and uh, got it ready for the show, turning on Skype, only to find that there was a message from her yesterday. Talk about talk about your faithful friends. She was there at 1030 wondering, well, hey, where are you? And I was certain that she had said to me, well, we're definitely going to be off the air next week because of the whole holiday thing. And so then when we scheduled the travel day, I figured, all right, well, ordinarily I, I would check in with Joan and say, all right, well, we're just going to have to skip it this week. But she ha- I had felt certain she had said, no, it's just not going to happen. But uh, she was compelled to show up on Skype anyway. That's, it's The draw is that strong, the gravitational force of the KITM universe. Uh, so, well, thanks, Joan. I'll have to send her a note and, and just thank her for uh, for showing up. And uh, say sorry. I hope you didn't. I hope you didn't wake up early to do that. Uh, it was the day after Christmas. I don't know if she's one of those. Maybe as a, as, she's just a big kid. She gets up so early in the morning to open up her Christmas presents, and then it's difficult to kick the habit. I don't know. But hopefully there was plenty of coffee, and uh, lots of good uh, maybe cookies and cakes and pies or something to uh, keep her going during the day. Okay, lots to catch up on. Uh, ordinarily, we would have spent, say, Monday and Tuesday talking about the, uh, well, TFG and his court cases, which he continues to lose in many cases, although I guess he caught a couple of breaks on Friday that, or at least one break on Friday, that I think has been overplayed by far. And I, I don't know whether the, uh, the, the reporters have made a correction yet, or the commentators have made a correction in their direction yet, but I'm here to uh, address some of that. I, there was a, a rush to declare the Supreme Court of the United States, not the Colorado Supreme Court, though they were big in the news over the weekend too. The Supreme Court of the United States, SCOTUS, if you will, uh, uh, denying the request of Jack Smith, the special prosecutor, for immediate uh, expedited review of Trump's claims, absurd claims, of absolute presidential immunity forever and for all things, no matter what. Amen. And uh, it's not as big a deal, I don't think, as it was made out to be immediately by the analysts. And I grabbed, I think, like a CNN article, just throwing in phrases, lines in there about a big victory for Trump and a big loss. And it was such a big gamble for Jack Smith. And it was none of those things. And I'll help explain why, I hope, or at least I'll give you my theory about why that is. Let's see what's on. uh, You know what? I'm I'm out of it. It's been a couple of holidays, you know, just uh, running around. There's been an awful lot of Christmas shows on TV and movies and the old classic cartoons and, uh, 
Good, I'm glad there's no room for news. So I don't even know, <laughs> no idea about what the hints are that justice is dropping today. I'm, I'll take a closer look. But I think one of them has to do with uh, Tesla's falling apart and or blowing up and uh, not working the way they're supposed to. And that's always, you know, in the news. And the other, I'll just ask for a clarification off the air and I'll get that. But in the meantime, Greg Dworkin is here. He knows what time he's supposed to call, just like Joan did. I really I have to drop a note to Joan and apologize. I hope she didn't wake up for that. Uh, and uh, I, I bet uh, Greg wishes he hadn't w- woken up for this one. So I don't know. You're an early riser, though, aren't you, Greg? I am. Okay. Uh, you know, and Abby makes sure. Uh, yes. But uh, I didn't even try on Monday, so I don't know if you had a show. I, know uh, I don't know either. Boxing Day. Yeah, right. Uh, normally I would have, but uh, yeah, we had we had some visitations to take care of yesterday. So, uh, you know, well done, I thought, and a nice for during the holiday week. And people want an extra day off, and no one really wanted to hear about Donald Trump yesterday anyway. Right, and uh, I don't think he's an Orthodox Christmas is till like uh, January 7th. Yeah, so, so we got know. lots of time. You can so still... today can't be Eastern Orthodox Boxing Day unless it right. comes before Christmas. I don't know. Uh, maybe they, they could make anything happen. You're still on your advent well, you calendar. I don't know that they can. Okay, well, if they could, then well, they would be well-founded as a religion if they could. Uh, yeah. So we so... had a whole bunch of uh, pundit roundups in the interim. Mm-hmm. And uh, basically, oh, yeah. okay. it's uh, relatively good news. Let me start off with a, right. uh, a cheery one Yay. in the midst of crisis. And this is by Jonathan V. Last over at the Bulwark, a Never Trumper. Okay. Be of good cheer. So here we go. Well, it's always interesting to see things from a conservative point of view. Hmm. Well. So uh, he says, look, you know what? America's going to face a crisis next year. 2024 is, you know, it's going to be awful in regard to Trump in on the ballot and all that. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah, that's we all see it coming. But we're not moving into this crisis in disarray. No, oh. De- Democrats are not in disarray. Well, Just objectively are they? speaking, he says, the forces of stability are actually in a strong position. Remember, Trump's chaos agent. So uh, hmm. stability is our side. Chaos is his side. Yes. For one. The pandemic is over. I don't think we appreciate this enough. COVID was so traumatic, we've memory hold how unstable and deadly a place America was four years ago. Now, the pandemic's still with us in the sense that you can still get COVID. It still makes sense to wear masks in peak season, which is going to be January if you're going to be in crowded places. Uh, But that's, you know, personal preference and it's not policy. and Nobody's really talking about it anymore. Mm -hmm. Yes. Just like, you know, people get hospitalized with flu and RSV and all these other viruses every year and people don't really talk about it, but it's not the same thing as what was happening in uh, uh, early 2020, 2019. You know, the, it, it was bad. Yeah, we didn't and know the what the economy thing was. Tanking, and it upset all of these supply chains and that led to inflation. And that, by the way, is over. So his next point that is part, the economy is strong. Uh-huh. Forget the attitude surveys. If you were handed reams of economic data, you'd come to two rock solid conclusions. The American economy is <laughs> in a good place. Low unemployment, bottom-led wage growth, increasing household wealth, solid GDP growth, and relative to the rest of the world, the American economy has performed marvelously. Every advanced economy would trade places with us in a heartbeat. All right. We're also not involved in any wars. It's not that uh, you know the Middle East and Ukraine don't count, but we're not directly involved. It's not the same thing. Yes, the conflicts in Iraq that. and Afghanistan are over. Our troops are no longer in harm's way. This gives America's extra freedom a maneuver in dealing with adversaries because mm-hmm. we don't have active conflicts leeching away political will on a daily basis. We simply have Republicans in the House leaching away political will <laughs> on a daily basis. Yeah, well. And yeah, the Democratic Party here. a healthy political institution. Give or take, you have the Bob Menendez and all of that. But watch the party reaction to it. Quite different than Republicans. Mm, True. Right. So he says the institutional Democratic Party is even opposed to extra legal acts and political violence when these modes are taken up by supposed members of its coalition. Uh, So the reaction of the Biden administration to anti-Semitism in 2023. Hmm. Okay. Now, Joe Biden's been a good president with good political instincts. From the moment he took office, and this is a conservative saying this, Biden has pursued a consistent strategy of trying to return American politics to a place of normalcy. His strategy was avoid radical change, pass lots of bipartisan legislation. On the issue of Trump, Biden's done everything possible to avoid pushing Republican voters into Trump's arms. He rarely speaks of him. 
which is what you were saying at the beginning of the show. Why do we have to talk about him all the time? Because he's mm-hmm. running. He's in the news. That's why. Uh, you know, and he, he uh, said some uh, pretty uh, yeah. ridiculous, horrible things on Christmas, for example. Uh, he's why behaved not? properly regarding all the investigations Biden has and criminal charges against Trump. And nearly every term, Biden has declined to participate in elevating Trump or adding to Trump's grievances. Hmm. Uh, and so I'd go so far as to say you could view Biden's shadow agenda as giving the Republican Party room to rehab itself. Hmm. If had, hmm. had been so inclined. Oh, OK. Well, the room was there, I guess. Yeah, exactly. I see. All right. I, and non-Republican I, voters I, have behaved responsibly. Am I leaving bad stuff out of the picture? Sure. The world's big, complicated and bad stuff's always part of the story. But you could see an alternative timeline where we met the crisis of 2024 on dangerous terrain. Instead, we'll meet it on the best possible terrain, hmm. the most defensible ground with a winning coalition of voters, a responsible version of the Democratic Party, and a restrained and successful incumbent president. Will that be appreciated? Not now. Now, everybody's, uh, you know, uh, uh, measuring Biden against a oft uh made up fake remembrance of what JFK must have been like because it was before you were born and you have no idea. Uh, <laughs> Camelot. You know, and, and so, well, he doesn't measure up to that. And uh, some of you weren't even born when uh, Reagan was president. And so you have no idea about that either. Yeah, you didn't miss anything. Or Jimmy but... Carter and what stagflation really is like. Oh, yeah. But if you, if you missed it, uh, bad. Uh, but there now, go. pretty good. So okay. what are the polls saying? The polls are all over the place. Some of them have Biden up eight in the swing states and now four in the swing states and none of them matter. And they're all dumb. And you shouldn't be asking. Nobody wants to talk about politics right now. It's Christmas. Uh Worst time to poll. And you don't really have any idea what that means in the long term because people still haven't wrapped their heads around the fact that uh, Trump and Biden are going to be the nominees. They they want somebody else. Well, you can't have it. Now what? Hmm. You know, we're not there yet. I'll tell you when we're there. Okay. Meanwhile. How are Republicans reacting? We talked about Democrats. This is Philip Bump. Mm. Jim Jordan's dishonest argument of wrongdoing by Biden. Yes. His well-honed persona has served him well, helping boost his authority within the Republican caucus. That there is a microcosm of everything. This is good for Trump with Republicans. Okay, this yeah. is all good for <clears throat> Trump with Republicans. Yeah. Yes, but this over here is good for Trump with Republicans. Mm. Well, we're talking about the primaries here. Well, so what? Nobody freaking cares. Yeah. It's only good with Republicans. So this has served him well, helping boost his authority within the Republican caucus and contributing to his elevation to lead the House Judiciary Committee. Mm -hmm. And with characteristic bluster and the characteristic lack of a jacket, Jordan made a sharp allegation of wrongdoing by Biden that was quickly revealed as unsubstantiated. Yeah. A tale as old as time. Politician takes action that makes money for his family, then tries to conceal it. Jordan began. Never forget four fundamental facts. First, that Joe Biden's son Hunter was appointed to the board of the Ukrainian energy company Burisma. Second, Hunter Biden was not qualified for the role. Uh, When Jordan made similar comments last week, CNN pointed out his articulation was misleading. Fact number three, the executives of Burisma asked Biden to weigh in. And fact number four, Biden goes to Ukraine and gives a speech attacking the prosecutor. He went on to suggest that these facts lend credence to secondhand allegation of bribery. And the important arguments are Jordan's third and fourth points. Uh, I listened to Congressman Jordan, said Michael Gerhardt, professor at the University of North Carolina, whom I respect a great deal when he said there are four facts and the first two weren't related to Biden at all. They're all about Hunter. And third, there's no executive. There were executives who asked Hunter Biden for help and no proof. That Biden mm-hmm. helped him. Yeah. And lastly, his fourth point, Joe Biden gave a speech. He did. That's what exists as basis for this inquiry. It's not sufficient. And oh. I say this with all respect. And I think it's part of the problem that many Americans think may exist with respect to these proceedings. Hmm. But it's actually worse than that. Right? No, well, Claims I think with no Asking Hunter Biden for help is established first in his appointment to the board. It's also addressed in testimony from Hunter Biden's business partner, Devin Archer. What Archer didn't say is this pressure was coming from the prosecutor in Ukraine, a man named Victor Shokin. Hmm. In fact, Archer testified Shokin wasn't on my radar. Okay. More importantly, Biden's speech in December wasn't what started the process. Hmm. And so none of the facts that uh, he brings up are, in fact, true. 
And then he goes on to other well, things that uh, Jordan so? said that weren't true. None of it was true. Uh, there was a point in the hearing where Jordan did his own fact checking, by the way. Democrats had pointed out that the amount of money received by Biden paled next to the amount vacuumed up by Jared Kushner. Sure. And uh, uh, Jordan said, yes, but in response, uh, Jared Kushner was the key player in the historic Abraham Accords. <laughs> I mean, but. OK, okay. stipulate. So what? Yeah, I mean, I'm not really sure what that means. And, and of course, uh, see, the thing about this is I've given you the. Yeah, the. Deep substance to the uh, inquiry. I guess that's, that's it. it. There's nothing right. else. It's interesting, too, that he starts off with, I mean, Jordan's own recitation of things. It's, oh, it's a tale as old as time, and da, 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 and you're meddling in something, and then money changes hand. I mean, and I love that his defense is, well, sure, he was getting, uh, Jared Kushner was getting billions of dollars from players in the Middle East, but remember that he brokered a deal in the Middle East. Yeah, yeah. that's... That's uh, so the that point. Would be what bribery? Yeah, I mean, yeah. I don't know why. Why is it a defense that? Well, you know, sure they were paying him off, but the the thing is, they were paying him off. Okay, and I don't understand what the, the how is that the defense? Well, I'm just saying. I, I know well, you're just you know, saying. Well, tangentially, but... since we're talking about that, let's uh, look okay. at this article. A couple of articles, maybe, by an ethics guy, Norm Eisen, special counsel to the House Judiciary Committee. Hmm. Uh, for the first Bad impeachment things. and trial of Donald Trump, uh, but also Sir Linda okay. Lake, who's a Democratic Party strategist and pollster. Yes. And a not Schenker Osario, sure. a political researcher and campaign advisor. Yes. And they have a guest essay in The New York Times called A Trump Conviction Could Cost Him Enough Voters to Tip the Election. I said the polls were dumb. Here's the only good thing that's in the polls. Yeah. All right. I'm okay. ready for non-dumb. Uh, it's entirely possible Trump will have at least one criminal conviction before November 2024. We're looking at you, Jack Smith. You're right. All of the, oh, he went to the Supreme Court and the Supreme Court said it's not ripe yet, which is their fond yeah. way of saying we're not ready to take this case. And there were no dissents and there was no write up, just not yet. Yeah. So what happens, it goes back to the appellate court. Right. And the appellate court is going to hear stuff on January 7th. Yeah. It's which right is, the I corner. think, uh, Eastern Orthodox Christmas or something like that. Right. And uh, they're going to uh, rule quickly. So, uh, no, it wasn't a setback for Jack Smith, except in the sense that it is possible, maybe likely, that the trial will be moved from March to May, which doesn't help Trump at all. Mm, yeah. I mean, he'll take any delay he can get, but that wasn't what right. he was looking for. Right, but that's for. not a big win. No, and I also am not certain that's going to happen. It's a big loss. Yeah, I, there's a number of reasons why this wasn't what it was reported to be, but but I'll get out of the way for the moment. I'll get back to those later. Well, you know, but Unless that's the main to, thing. You know. Trump is trying to delay the trial till after the election. That is his only legal strategy because yes. he knows he's going to lose otherwise. If he doesn't get that, he loses. That you know, period. Yeah. Well, right. So he's no relief from that. Um, I mean, as far as the, what the, I guess I'll just throw it out there that what the what the Supreme Court did there was, um, if it was their intention, if it, just making this up, I don't know if this is their intention, but if it was their intention to just say, you know what, um, oh well, I guess we we'll lay the groundwork for this by saying uh, when CNN's reporter said, well, this was a huge gamble by Smith and it didn't pay off. This is the very opposite of a gamble. He right. literally took this to two the two courts that could hear it and said, both of you, either of you. Will will someone take this on, on an expedited review? And they pondered, they looked. The D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals said, yeah, we will. And then the Supreme Court said, oh, you're going to? All right, then we'll wait. That, right. that was it. That yeah. was the big now, gamble. Normally, he got the expedited hearing. Again, I'm not a lawyer and not an expert, but all the experts say, you know what? The Supreme Court really likes the appellate courts to go first because then they have something to chew over. Yes. You, remember you do everyone... the work. Why do I have to do all the work for you? You do it and yeah. I'll look at it. And then they'll say yes, no, maybe to it. You're the student. Uh, I'm the teacher. Remember I'm not that writing the... your essay for you. You yeah. write the essay. I'll critique it. How about that? You'll probably remember from last week, it wasn't that long ago, that the extraordinary part of what Smith was doing was that he was asking them to weigh in before the circuit court. It's It's been done. It happens in, in extraordinary cases. He asked them, do you want to do this? And they said, mm, well, you know, they said, wait a second for a minute. And they were pondering it before they heard from the circuit court. When the circuit court said, well, we'll step up and do it real fast. Then they said, well, why don't we just do it the normal way then? 
and that's it. And so knowing that, I was going to say, if the, if the Supreme Court just theoretically had in mind the idea of saying, well, this is an extraordinarily stupid claim that Trump is making here, absolute presidential immunity, while president, after presidency, maybe before presidency, doesn't, we don't even know. It's that dumb. Uh, and it's, if, if it was their view that this is such a stupid thing that they didn't even want to spend a moment of their precious time on it. And their intention was, oh, the DC Circuit Court is going to take it and say that probably. Fine. You go first and then you say how dumb it is. And then Trump will say, that's not fair. It really is smart. Tell them, Supreme Court, at which point we'll say, no. The D.C. Circuit Court got it right. We're denying cert. They made a decision. It's fine with us. We're going to let it stand. If that was their intention all along, the the answer they gave on Friday would look nothing different from what they put out. There was this, oh, well, it was such a brief dismissal, and they they said nothing about it. They were so curt. That indicates that they're not inclined towards it. No, it, it absolutely doesn't. This is exactly how they would, and I don't know that this is their intention, but this is no different from how they would handle it if they said, this thing is not worth our time. I can't believe that Smith has to even come to us with this. Is there any way to make somebody else who's supposed to do this work, do this work quickly? Yeah, you do it. I'll do it. You're going to do it? All right. Speaking of not knowing intention, I'll give you another angle. And I'm not saying Smith had this in, in mind, but this is the result. Okay. Yeah. All right. Supreme Court, you don't want to think about it. I'm going to make you think about it, even yes. for a moment. Okay, that's true too. And part of that thought process, you have to talk to Clarence Thomas to see what he thinks. And you know what? <laughs> now you have to start thinking about what are we going to do with Clarence Thomas? Yeah, Does he accuse I himself. Guess, that's true. I got too. to think about that now. I didn't want to think about that, but Jack Smith is making us think about that. Mm. Yeah, I want some time. So no, we're not going to do anything. Uh, yeah. And honestly, it doesn't break down all that badly either. I know a lot of people have doubts about well, what are the Supreme Court going to do? There's so many weirdo conservatives who are so loyal to the Republican Party. You never can tell with these guys. All right. Well, what they've just told us is, well, and instead of us taking it up right away and giving the final word on it, yeah, why don't we let a does. very liberal panel of the D.C. Circuit handle it first? Look um, what they did with stuff uh, coming out of Texas. Yeah, that's a ridiculous ruling. It makes no sense. Oh, yeah, we'll take it. <laughs> yes, they definitely have done weird things and you never can tell with these guys. And and so it's also not out of the question to say, well, as many people did, well, they, they denied uh, uh, Smith's request. That means they're inclined against him. No, it I could be, it but as, I don't think look, so. They didn't say Trump won. That's yeah. a win for Jackson. That's yeah, that's true too. I just, but the idea it really struck me that they were saying, oh, "What a gamble it was!" And it, for it to be a gamble, I don't know. I don't understand how it's a gamble. They went to two appeals courts, and one of them said, "Yes, we'll take it right away." Right. What's the gamble? Take it from a long-suffering New York Rangers fan. Mm-hmm. You don't know who won and lost in the first period. Okay. Remember, hockey is the only game that has three quarters. <laughs> yes. Well, yeah, I got to work on that. Yeah, we're still working on that. Anyway, so Norm Eisen, the yes. uh, lawyer who is right. this ethics guy, has guy. this uh, article about polling, and he points out something interesting. All right. And I, I like the way he turns a phrase here. Hmm. The negative impact of conviction has emerged in polling as a consistent through line over the past six months nationally and in key states. We're not aware of a poll that offers evidence to the contrary. The swing in this data away from Trump varies, but in a close election, Mm -hmm. any movement can be decisive. Okay. To be clear, we should always be cautious of polls this early in the race, posing hypothetical questions about conviction or anything else. Voters can know only what they think they will think about something Mm. that hasn't happened yet. True, I think. I think well, we've I think seen the that. effect in national surveys <laughs> over and over, like a recent Wall Street Journal poll. Trump leads by four, but if Trump is convicted, five point swing, Biden's ahead. And another new poll by Yahoo News and YouGov, swing is seven points. In the December New York Times Siena poll, almost a third of Republican primary voters believe Trump shouldn't be the party's nominee if he's convicted, even after winning the primary. <laughs> In swing no. state voters and recent CNN polls from Michigan and Georgia, and Mr. Trump holds a solid lead. The polls didn't report head-to-head numbers if Trump is convicted. But if he is, 46% of voters in Michigan and 47% in Georgia agree he should be disqualified. 
It makes mm-hmm. sense the effort slightly greater in swing states. And the same polls also provide insights into the effect of a Trump conviction would have an independent and young voters. Independents go for Trump 45-44, if you believe it. However, if he's convicted, 53 of them choose Biden and 32 go with Trump. Oh. And the movement for voters 18 to 29 is even greater. Biden holds a slight edge, 47-46. After a potential conviction, 63-31 Biden. Okay. Other swing state polls have matched these findings. So the point is, looking at these polls now is ridiculous because there's too much. It, it As the Supreme Court might say, it hasn't ripened yet, I this election. So. Okay. Well, you know, we're forced to look at it because that's what we do. Yeah, because but this just polls to tell you to look a win away. for Trump because I say oh. so. Because why? Yeah. I because, like, uh, you know, you what like do you want it. me to do? Actually talk about policy? Hmm. Well, that would be Isn't like talking yet. about the economy and talking about oh. what J.B. Last was talking about in terms of the, the overall uh, situation in the country. That's boring. <laughs> True. Economy's good. That's boring. Boring. You know it. Yeah. True. So we'll talk about <laughs> the economy loud. when the break comes back because, <laughs> hey, I'm boring. So Okay. Uh, no. Uh, but uh, the economy is, however, I was wondering about that when you were saying, well, if you just hand people these, uh, these latest reports on the economy, uh, and you went diff- a different direction, but I was going to say they, they don't understand it and they fall asleep. Is that yeah, what but they Yeah, but they are traveling in record numbers and yes. buying in record numbers. And True. it was a very, very good, uh, holiday season. And we'll talk about that when we come back. Okay. And the holiday season continues among the Eastern Orthodox. Uh, there's probably a good, I don't know, week or two left in there's your- a lot more to buy. Olive advent calendar, I guess, probably. And uh, I don't know. What goes into an advent calendar? Do they do it? I don't know. Uh, we should spend a holiday season with Eastern Orthodox family at some point and, and uh, learn to enjoy it. But uh, and then, then we'll know what dates things are going to happen. I need a better calendar. Hi, everybody. It's me, David Waldman. Yes, the same guy who interrupts you all the time. Interrupting you one more time. Just to tell you again, another reminder that your contributions are what keep this show on the air and Patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com is still among the easiest ways to make the sustaining subscription donations that keep us afloat. Are you ready for the pep talk about how our Patreon campaign is still going strong and growing? Well, too bad. Yeah, the plain fact is we actually are headed in the wrong direction and Whereas we once had about uh, 175 monthly patrons, we're now actually down below 150. Time to recruit some more. Not exactly the kind of news I wanted to share, but there it is. For those of you in a position to support the show, Patreon.com does make it easy to make those secure recurring monthly contributions to do so. Patreon.com slash KGROWX gets you straight to our donation page. We've been through a lot together. The worst of the pandemic, we hope. The worst of the insurrection, we hope. So go ahead and treat yourself. You don't need an excuse. Give yourself the gift of a little something you enjoy in life. Support the show. And of course, if you happen to prefer using PayPal or even the Square Cash app, we're up and running on those options too. So thanks again, everyone, for all your support. We couldn't, or at least shouldn't, do it without you. Hope you'll be on board soon too. Thanks for all your support. All right. Welcome back now to the KGRO in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. We continue with our second segment. Greg's still with us. Uh, all the holiday rush behind us. We can relax and take a look at the economy. Yeah, I don't know. That's uh, Isn't that what most people want to do with this holiday season? Well, if they don't, they Put should. Put their feet up and, and review the economic numbers. Right. So let me give you uh, a bunch. I I got a couple and then Dave Dharma fell through in a couple of the political scientists about New York Times headlines, which is sort of interesting. Hmm. This is right. the New York Times holiday spending increase defying fears of a decline while the pace of growth <laughs> slowed. Spending stayed strong because of robust job growth and strong wage gains. That's just an unabashedly good news headline. It is unlike the New York Times. Yeah, it's uh, unusual. They, they did. They, they took a. Yeah, uh, defying the expectations of of horror. I thought that was interesting, but okay. Yeah, defying the expectations of uh, economists. Okay, well, that's another story altogether. And then just underneath that, uh, uh, to point out the the uh, split screen there. Mm -hmm. Their next headline is downturn or not. At year's end, Wall (laughs) Street is split on what's ahead. 
analysts bullish on 2023 were largely right Mm -hmm. and expect more of the same in 2024. The bears caution the Federal Reserve's impact is yet to be determined, which is basically the New York Times editor is find me a contrarian. I'll print it. Okay. Because pretty much as Paul Krugman has eloquently uh, summed up, how come economists never admit they were wrong? They were all wrong. Hmm. The doves were right. Right. The we had a soft landing. They said it was impossible. We said the Fed shouldn't overdo it. We were right. Yes, but you don't know what's going to happen. Well, fine. In the long run, we're all dead. Is a very famous economist. Uh, yeah, I guess. Well, <laughs> uh, I don't know. Maybe it comes from uh, softer uh, testing. That statements. was actually out of the FDR administration. It wasn't John Kendrick Galbraith, but he liked the line. Yeah. Well. It was good of him to recognize it. was Harry Hopkins, it. I believe, but, you know. You would I, never have known I, it. I'd have to double-check myself. I'd like if to fact-check myself. Galbraith didn't repeat it, you would have never known it. So uh, He makes things famous. This is Jamie Dupre, who writes a, uh, a newsletter called Regular Order. Very clever guy, oh. Jamie Dupre. Hmm. And he talks about uh, some of the big things going on, and he focuses on the economy. And he says one of the biggest challenges in 2024 for Biden is to convince voters the economy is doing better than many think. The numbers are certainly in there. After a strong year in the markets, no recession, as predicted by many experts, and a drop in Uh consumer prices. But the hangover from high inflation and higher interest rates is still in Biden's way. On his way to Camp David before Christmas, Biden jabbed at reporters about stories on the economy, something he's done more frequently in recent weeks. What your out, what's your outlook on the economy, Biden was asked. It's all good. Mm-hmm. Start reporting it the right way. Hmm. And the New York Times Pretty is. Pretty Biden-ish. No recession. The basic economic numbers would seem to favor an incumbent in the White House. We've seen all-time records on the Dow Jones. Unemployment rate under four for almost two consecutive years. Stronger than expected economic growth. Won't even talk about the jobs report, which is, as we like to say in the trade, historic. <laughs> oh. All right. Metrics. Consumer confidence is up, and the economy grew 4.9% last quarter, said Mike Thompson, Democrat, California. Economic data show solid job growth, rising wages, and consumer confidence falling unemployment and inflation, added Don Bayer, Democrat, Virginia. Oh, yes, okay. Where's where's his district? He's right up northern Virginia. Don Bayer. Uh, he's not yours. No, but he's uh, more Arlington- uh, direction. Ah, Arlington so uh, uh, DC adjacent, really? Yeah. Like subway stop adjacent. Yes, absolutely. Uh, election year, but the polls have repeatedly shown trouble for Biden on the economy. That's not what you want when you're running for re-election. As James Carville said in 1992, it's the economy, stupid, but it's the campaign. Hmm. Remember, uh, evaluate everything that happens in the next few months through the lens of a campaign year. Biden will certainly try to hammer home a message of economic achievement, and Republicans will try to cast the current economy as one which is ready to go off a cliff. He's right in terms of what they'll try to do, yes. but I have to point out, if Republicans are trying to cast the current economy as one which is ready to go off the cliff, they're overreaching and they're going to fail, because it's not. The partisans may say, look, I like the economy, but I'm not going to tell the pollsters that, but they know what's going on. And you can't convince neutral people that the economy is ready to go off a cliff when everybody sees it getting better. You can say it's not better enough. I don't like how much peak things cost. Not the same thing. Uh, yes. But people uh, do run around and uh, plug their ears and run around saying it's they terrible could. anyway. Does that affect how you're going to vote? It not this shouldn't. early. If, you, if the guy has fingers in his ears. Yeah. Yeah. People He's telling think you about don't what listen. They are going to think about without it getting there yet? Yeah. They don't know. Yeah, don't listen to that guy. Right, and he's not even able to pump his own gas. He's got his. Oh, by the way, ears. in that previous story I was talking about, this is an yes. interesting MSNBC piece here. Clarence Thomas's next step will test SCOTUS ethics code and democracy itself. Unfortunately, right. the court's new ethics canon leaves those kinds of decisions to the justices themselves. By yeah. Armin Eisen. That's the that's the old ethics code. And so the does the new ethics. Facing momentous you know? term and momentous decision, the first of December's bombshells was special counsel Jack Smith's request that the Supreme Court expedite consideration. On Friday, the justices declined to step in for now. Mm-hmm. As we explained earlier this month, there's no absolute immunity. Trump's likely going to lose this appeal. And with the D.C. Circuit handling the matter on an accelerated basis, it's back to the Supreme Court in short order. Yeah. And that's all you have to say about it. Now, the next explosive development at the court was this decision to hear arguments in U.S. v. Fisher, 
which concerns obstruction of an official proceeding statute under which Trump and scores of others were charged. In the worst case, the court could kneecap two of the four charges against Trump, though that's unlikely, but he's still convicted on the other two. So even that would be a definite win for Trump and loss for uh, Smith, but not a fatal one. Mm, okay. And we'll now, throw in an insurrection charge after that. as if all of that were not enough, the 14th Amendment case will certainly make its way to the high court. Okay, you talked about SCOTUS. Now mm -hmm. we have SCOCO. SCOCO, all right. Also SCOWIE. Mm. <laughs> That's Wisconsin. Yeah, okay. Supreme Court of Wisconsin. So uh, SCOCO is going to wind up at SCOTUS. Mm -hmm. uh, Skoko is clearly right on the facts and on the law, but we recognize that this case will by no means be easy sledding at the court, and everybody's already gamed out about how they'll weasel out of it while still getting Trump out of the mm. situation. So uh, we recognize that the unanimity that characterized important democracy cases of the past, Brown v. Board of Ed, U.S. v. Nixon, too much to hope for here, that's the Nixon tapes, but there should be one point of agreement across the high court. Thomas must recuse himself. And I'm saying that bringing it up to SCOTUS is going to force him to think about that earlier rather than later. Why? Because yes. Cheney Thomas was part of the Stop the Steal movement. That's why he needs to recruit himself. Right. But then, they'll, of course, he, he won't. And, and he'll say, well, that is, see, that's a different person, not me. And right. That, of course, that means we must temper any hope he'll do the right thing. If Thomas yeah. doesn't recuse himself, no matter how they turn out, he and the court will be blemished in the annals of history. That's true. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, uh, sometimes that matters. Sometimes that doesn't. And let me give you an example where annals of history uh, sort of does matter, at least to the individuals. There's two stories that struck me on the mm -hmm. uh, gun safety issue that uh, were, were really poignant. Mm. And the first okay. one is uh, from the New York Times. It's called The Covenant Parents Aren't Going to Keep Quiet on Guns. A group of parents reeling from a mass shooting at their children's private Christian school believe no one was in a better position to persuade the GOP to enact limited gun control, except it was Tennessee. Oh, And the article goes on to describe just how horrified they were that the Republicans in the state legislature were simply not interested in listening to them. Wow, they shut down yes. conversation. Hmm. They wouldn't let them speak. They privately said, I hear you. I feel your pain. And publicly said, we're not going anywhere near there. And uh, it was just an amazing experience for them, which... Uh, you know, coming from Newtown was, yeah, been there, done that. <laughs> yes. Uh, and that's the second piece that's so interesting. But there was one part I wanted to read to you. Okay. Uh, they were having a hearing and Republicans shut the hearing down for a recess. And when the hearing was reconvened, the fury was evident in Ms. McLean's voice, brandishing a photograph that included the three children who were killed. She demanded justification for more guns on school property. When the surviving students were still terrified of loud noises, they wanted to have a, uh, a special license, conce mm -hmm. a special concealed carry license, which would allow them to carry guns on school property. Uh, the school board wanted this? Uh, this is the state legislature. The state, okay. So Newman, Ms. Newman stormed out when a Republican lawmaker suggested if guns were less readily available, the assailant would simply have run over the children at recess. Ah. Uh. Because, you know, cars are a pocket. weapon. You can't ban those. Right. But she sure. returned, hands trembling, to count the votes that sunk the bill. It's demoralizing, some of the mothers said. This is the part I want to read. To be talked down to, to see lawmakers who would sympathize with their pain in private still vote against them in public, to be told it was too soon for such serious charges, mm -hmm. uh, changes, or that any change at all would threaten the Second Amendment. Yeah. Did well, you know the parents yeah. asked one another that it was like this? How did I not know? <laughs> well... Okay, mm. fine. Yes, but they know now. I want to contrast that with an article from the Washington Post, hmm. which is focusing on the Sandy Hook parents and okay. Democratic senators hmm. and how they uh, feel now right. about their actions then. Okay. That so, seems like uh, a good idea. Uh, one of the, and, and this is poignant to me, of course, because I know these folks They're from my town, Ben Wheeler. Uh, was slaughtered by a gunman with an AR-15, and his mother was on Capitol Hill pleading with a U.S. Senator, Heidi Heitkamp, mm. to understand her grief. Francine Wheeler wanted to know what Senator Heidi Heitkamp would do if it had been her six-year-old child who was murdered. 
And as I read this to you, think about the uh, Coventry family in uh, Tennessee and what they're going through now. Yeah. She wouldn't look at me, Wheeler recalled recently about the April 2013 encounter with the newly elected Democrat of North Dakota, a conservative state with deep support for gun rights. Heitkamp was defensive, unkind and not interested in helping or listening to the stories of our loved ones. When the session ended, Heitkamp stayed in her office, sitting at the table with her head down, recalled David Thomas, a lobbyist who escorted Wheeler and other Sandy Hook parents in the meeting as the entourage left. Laura Berthgold, another consultant helping the family, said she heard the senator break out into sobs. Hmm. And what did she do? She voted against the bill. Yeah, well, sob a little bit and then uh, you get your uh, back up and say no. Right. Great. And uh, not that I agree with the exact language of these bills, but it was my obligation looking backwards to provide leadership. Even though I was there a hot minute to make these bills better, Heitkamp, who was sworn into office a few weeks after Sandy Hook, said in one of two recent interviews, Mm -hmm. I didn't do that. My activity was passive, not active in searching for a solution. And that I regret. She didn't recall the meeting with Wheeler, but was, how do you not recall that meeting? I think she recalled that meeting. But was extraordinarily sorry for leaving families with the sense that she didn't care about the children who were killed or the experiences of the grieving parents. If any person was left with the impression I had anything other than the most supreme sympathy and just hurt, that's a failure on my part. I couldn't apologize more. The six others who described the post, their changed perspectives on gun policy were Michael Bennett, Martin Heinrich, Angus King and Mark Werner, as well as former Senators Begich and Udall. Hmm. It's rare for politicians to shift their views on policy issues as culturally divisive as gun rights, but the expressions of remorse underscore how the failure to change laws in response to Sandy Hook continues to haunt many who held power at the time. And, you know, it's just, it's amazing. Yes. Looking back, Heitkamp said only later in her term did she begin to assert herself more aggressively, a process of becoming more certain and becoming senator. You're going to take votes that will upset probably in those cases the majority of your constituency, but those are votes that have a permanency beyond your service. Well, yeah. So uh, she's basically reflecting probably what the Republicans in Tennessee are thinking now mm-hmm. and how the Republicans are going to think about well, it 10 years from now. I have no idea. I know I that these Democratic yeah. senators regret it, but basically yeah. they were cowards. The they didn't have any well. backbone. They did the wrong thing. They weren't able to stand up to the lobbyists. They regret yeah. it now, and it's too late. Yeah, although, uh, you know, <laughs> several of them are still there, and I don't see them uh, pushing their way to the microphones to say they want to reverse things now either. But uh, Well, they don't have yeah. the votes. They're not going to do right. it if they don't have the votes. Yeah. There is well, a time well. <laughs> where they actually could have done it. Yeah. That's true. And uh, it is interesting. I mean, it's an interesting perspective, Heitkamp, saying these things. And it, it uh, it's interesting that she uh, makes the argument, well, these things would have had a something that, you know, a permanency that outlives her tenure or whatever it was. But but of course, yeah, at the, the time, yeah, not there anymore. I yeah, guess sure. right. Exactly. Like then. But but what if my tenure does outlive this uh, uh, this whole crisis? And uh, Which is that's what I'm aiming for. Tenure, I'm not going to think that way. Right. If I if I yeah, right. If I win, then no, maybe I don't feel so bad or maybe I feel bad, but I've won. But yeah, now that I know that I was going to lose anyway, uh, why didn't I do the right thing? I don't know. And would you have been joined by other people who thought the same thing and did survive and are there now saying I regret it then? Eh, I don't know. Maybe, maybe. Yeah, you hope just, so. It's an amazing situation. It is. And also, just really frustrating because, amazing. you know, they knew what the right thing was. That's why yes. she was sobbing at her desk. Right. They knew. Yeah. They didn't do it. That's very, it's insightful. I mean, I, I, I'm kind of glad to know that. It, so she wasn't a, a stone wall about it. That's, that's good. I wish she had done the right thing. But if I can't have that, then at least I want to know she heard him. Which is interesting, uh, in contrast with what the parents in Tennessee are finding. And at one, I'm I'm amazed that they're amazed, but you know I could see why they weren't necessarily paying attention up until now. But two, I, I also kind of just throw out there the uh, the implications for remember these are what conservative parents speaking to their Republican legislators, who the legislators themselves nationwide running, of course, they're all uh, hoping to be able to run on the listen to parents thing that uh, that Glenn Youngkin apparently made famous, but of course made famous on the backs of one, Moms for Liberty, now collapsing, and two, Chris Rufo, 
who's, you know, gone off the deep end and, and then hitched his wagon to DeSantis. So we'll see w- whether he collapses or not, too. But the whole idea, the whole Republican platform was going to be, well, you got to listen to parents and parents have a right to do this, that and the other thing in the school system. And oh, oh guns. What? Oh, no. Shut up, parents. We don't want to hear from you. You have no rights here in the school system. Get lost. Now, wow, here, I don't know. here's an interesting procedural thing that that uh, article about uh, Heitkamp and the senators brings up, wow. which is worth remembering because okay. we generally gloss over it. But here's where procedure is important. I, I feel like we go too in depth on that. But all right, let's see. November 17th, 1993. It's a key point. So it's not 93. Too OK. A measure to ban certain semi-automatic weapons passed mm-hmm. the Senate. By a simple majority before the filibuster became a standard procedure (laughs) and went on to be enacted as part of a sweeping 1994 crime bill signed by President Bill Clinton. So when the semi-automatic weapons ban passed, you only needed 50 votes. In April of 2013, Mm -hmm. a measure to restore the previous ban on semi-automatic weapons failed, but you needed 60 votes because by then the filibuster was established as like we do it on everything. Yeah, everybody knows it takes 60 votes to... Right, but it didn't take 60 votes back in the day it passed. Just a reminder. Uh, Yeah, I mean, they certainly could have done it, and it wasn't like we didn't know what the filibuster was or they didn't use it to great frustration. But it's when people say it's harder to pass now than before, that's one of the major reasons. It's Mm -hmm. like a major reason. Yes, and so, yeah, well, we did it before. Why can't we do it now? Because the rules have changed. Yeah, well, people have gone, yeah, people have gone bonkers. And uh, all you really need to do to see how far it's gone uh, is remind yourself that like uh, 10 seconds ago, you were just talking about Tommy Tuberville, a uh, complete idiot, ruining the entire military single-handedly. Some of the senators who spoke to the Post acknowledged they've been influenced by the political power of the NRA and its allies and now feel they've been yes. wrong to elevate the convenience of law-abiding gun owners over the opportunity to limit gun violence. Some said they changed their minds after emotional conversations with victims' families hmm. or their own children. Yes. And they're hoping Good. for a second chance to finally do right by Newtown. Heinrich, a lifetime gun yeah. owner and hunter, said that after the Parkland massacre, his, massacre, his son Carter, then in high school, uh, mm-hmm. Well, when your kid tells you you're wrong with that much conviction, you need to stop and think about it. He's from New Mexico. Yeah. Well, all right. And he had voted against the 2013 assault weapons ban. Mm-hmm. The bill wasn't perfect, but when you weigh that against what we've experienced, if that were on the floor now, would I vote for it? Oh, yeah. I didn't okay. feel at the time like this was my issue. And I think after you experience a decade of mass shootings, it's everybody's yes. issue. That will change things, too. Yeah. Heinrich recently introduced legislation that does not go as far in eliminating dangerous firearms, but instead would limit ammunition, magazines, and restrict other mm-hmm. lethal features from certain semi-automatic weapons. They sponsor the bill with Mark Kelly. Uh, okay. And uh, back in 2013, many senators felt pressure from the NRA. Heitkamp said she could tell where most of the voters in her state stood. The NRA in some ways reflects the constituency, but Wheeler... Knowing that Heitkamp would not face voters for another five years, said she left the senator's office feeling angry, sad, and confused as to why she wouldn't help us. Mm-hmm. I don't know what was worse, Wheeler said. The senators who wept for Ben and voted no are the senators like Heitkamp who never even listened in the first place. Mm-hmm. That's pretty harsh. Yeah. Well, yeah, so uh, both. Heitkamp really effed up. Yeah, that'll happen. And it's interesting, though, too, that it happens, as they pointed out, well, she wasn't going to face voters for another five years, which is supposed to be the benefit of giving them such long terms. Like, you know, right. you can, this the, is when you're town, supposed to risk Families it. are pretty sophisticated, and they had, you know, pretty sophisticated advice and, and counsel going in there. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Heitkamp really effed up. I mean, yeah. if 10 yeah. years later this is what you think, Heitkamp really effed up. Yeah, you're, you, you've spent more time regretting it than you spent in office. Think about that, I guess. You should remind well, another, people like that. You're gonna, you are gonna you got a whole How lifetime left to didn't win re-election because she yeah. wasn't a very good politician? Right. Well, then there's that. Uh, and I'm sure that uh, it would have – it certainly could argue it would have hastened her exit, except she exited at the same time. You can't hasten five otherwise. years. It's going to yeah. be five years from now. Yeah. Like, well, you'll lose your next election. Well, I, I have news for you. You're very likely to lose your next election anyway. So you can but, – but the thing you should probably think about is what if you're haunted for another 50 years for your mistake? Hmm. Weigh that in there. What if you're – 
But if you could, with a clean conscience, say, I stood for election and lost, but I did the right thing and saved many, many lives and answered these parents correctly, well, you'll probably feel better about that. Right. Good cautionary And then tale. the final piece to comment on here, this is a Reuters piece say, uh, saying, asserting, claiming that uh, Joe Biden is going to put abortion rights at the center of his reelection campaign. Every statewide ballot question about reproductive rights since 2022, seven and all, has yielded victory for abortion rights advocates, including in conservative states, just as Ohio, Kansas, and Kentucky. Mm -hmm. uh, Republican presidential candidates, including uh, Donald Trump, have struggled to articulate a position on abortion that would satisfy both the evangelical Christians, a narrator note, they cannot be satisfied, right. who comprise a critical Republican voting bloc as well as the swing voters who prefer abortion remain accessible. Mm -hmm. uh, it's pretty evident, both with the research right, and yeah. elections we held in 2023, abortion is a winning issue for us at Daniel Butterfield, the executive director of Priorities USA, a Democratic super PAC. Uh, we plan to communicate heavily on the issue heading to 2024. So that's one of the many, uh, the terrain is pretty good for Democrats articles. We started with one. I thought I would finish with one. Well, all right then. Now, having done that, having done do you that, feel like you want to finish with something else instead? <laughs> I don't know. Can't you finish with something else for five minutes? It's fine. No. Uh, well, that's really what I have. That is Okay. Uh, and I'm willing to accept that. All right. Well, you know, uh, it's uh, it's it is has it is an interesting change in uh, terrain. Just sort of watching that too. I guess has been very different lately. Different than we thought, or, or different than we thought we would hear Democratic consultants saying. Oh, we have to go back a little ways now since it's been the last couple of years has been these disruptive statewide elections but uh, 10 years ago to, to to imagine that democratic consultants would be saying yeah we would this is an issue we definitely want to make central to our campaign it's a winning issue for us so just thinking about how many years they were like we ha absolutely must hide from this and just leave the laws on the books and and re rely on roe v wade being quote unquote settled law and they've attempted to you know they've had the cases and SCOTUS to overturn it a couple of times, and they keep shying away from it. Let's just hope they always shy away from it. Uh, well, they didn't. Right. So I found another item I'll sneak in before oh, I leave. Right. I should have just let you do it's it. It's a voting pop quiz. Uh-oh. Uh, okay. <clears throat> How let's many take times it. in 2015 and 2019, the last two elections? 15 and 19. What? Where? Okay, 2015 and 2019, the year before the election. Oh, year before the election. Okay. Because we're in 2023. It's the year before the election. Temporarily, yes. Right. Okay. How many times in those years, what? Between the two eventual nominees, how many times in those years did uh, polling leads exchange? One person caught the other, passed them, and then the other oh. person caught the other and passed them. Uh, in 2015 and 2019, how many lead changes took place? Uh, in the general election? In the general election between the two eventual nominees. And... Uh, Zero. Correct. Yay. <laughs> All right. That, that seems like a trick question. how many question. times has Trump and Biden exchanged a lead five times this year is the answer. Oh. So uh, the point is mm. uh, oh. it's a close race. Swing voters exist, and uh, you can't tell what's going on. Oh. I just thought I would point that out. Okay. Yeah. Uh, true also. And I, also, uh, I saw a warning on social media yesterday to beware of uh, weird – uh, manipulations of graphics, I think, was a Fox News thing showing tracking polls. And they were trying to illustrate, oh, Trump is pulling ahead in more polls. And uh, which I guess you can you can still say that and, and be right. But they uh, offered up some sort of, uh, you know, line graph of the two lines crossing and uh, but but wanted very badly to show the gap widening, uh, even though the numbers did not widen, but they just made the lines widen anyway, I thought, or the gap between the, the lines widen anyway, to make it look like a one-point lead when it was Biden's was tiny, whereas a one-point lead when it's Trump is five times larger in the gap. And 
I don't know if you caught that one, but probably not if you no, were watching but Fox. I didn't pay too but much attention to what Fox Yeah, is. this was just, I, I wasn't either. This was somebody else saying, look at this crap I saw on television. Can you believe what I almost stepped in? <laughs> sort of thing. Here, wow, look at this. Now, now that graphic is circulating, of course. And, but on Blue Sky, it's okay. I don't know. On uh, Twitter, they say, uh, this is the reason we want to, to put everyone in re-education camps or something. Mm. Whatever they're doing on Twitter these days. So uh, that's it. Just okay. Remember that's a good that, number of uh, things. You know, the election is a year away. Yes. But uh, in, in a week or so, but the it'll year be is a week the away. year right. of elections. That's right. Election it's a year away. Election itself right. is a year away, but election year is a week away. Right. Uh, yeah. Uh, so we have that going for us, which is nice. You should, uh, my advice, start writing 2024 on your checks. Now, I guess. I don't know. So that you're used to it in time because no one writes checks anyway. But yeah. I guess just start writing the date. Practice writing the date. And then you'll have it all correct. And then uh, then you can write checks and donate to a uh, Democratic campaign. Yeah, while you're at it, you know, sign the checks no one and even write does my that. name on them. Right, absolutely. Yeah, if you want <laughs> <laughs> it's a good just idea. You practice. Want practice, right. You know, sure. Send it to me for practice, and uh, I'll I'll grade you on it. Mm-hmm. Oh, well, I was going to ask something about uh, yeah, younger voters or older. Ah, this is not a solicitation, now. folks. Mm. This is uh, merely a right. jest, a jape, as it were. Ooh, nice. Okay, good. And a good SAT word there. Uh, helping the kids prepare. Okay, well, very good. I think that's a good number of stories. We have the break coming up very shortly. I'll fill another hour full of wonderful things, and uh, probably uh, while you get you know back remember in what I meant things. to say. Yes, that will happen. Well, that's your next hour. It's yeah. Practice. Oh well, then I'll do that. Okay. Next hour is practice hour, folks. The <laughs> real show comes tomorrow. Yes. I know it feels like that. Uh, certainly, uh, there, oh well. I, I was hoping this would occur to me uh, before you left, but it'll probably only happen afterwards. But there was something. I'll I'll go back over your stories and say there was something uh, I meant to ask well, about I, younger I voters you who haven't was, experienced no things yet. Yeah, that's right. I mean, neither do I. I'm I'm, I'm not certain I'm ever going to come up with this one. But if I stare at the pictures that accompany these uh, stories you sent me long enough. Perhaps it will occur to me. That's a conversation between old friends. You know, you bring up an interesting point. I'd agree with you if I had any idea what the hell you were talking about. <laughs> That's right. Uh, yeah. Can you help me bring up an interesting point? <laughs> I forgot what the one I wanted to make was. Okay. Well, very good. We have made it to the end of the hour. Then we have that going for us, which and is nice. And we're still friends. Isn't yeah. that amazing after all these shows? Terrific. After all these shows. Right. I mean, something should make us, you know, angry you, and disagree. You think, you know, but no. Yeah, well, uh, I'm so agreeable, I usually just uh, say yes to whatever it is. And which, say, which is really we'll uh, figure this out tomorrow. I have to say. Yeah, well, uh, disarming and charming. We'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> Take care. All right, welcome back now to the Can't Grow in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. Let's see, I don't, you know, I didn't come up with it, uh, but maybe in discussion in the next hour. I will remember what it was. I just uh, the vague feeling of the question I wanted to ask him, uh, but we'll have another crack at it tomorrow, and I'm sure a better show as a result tomorrow. In the meantime, let's see, lots to catch up on, a lot of things I put away for discussion for the second hour, and uh, to turn back to figure out, just in case you were. Uh, curious about this, and I'm not positive whether uh, Justice has this lined up for his show. That's not always the case when he drops hints about what's on his mind early in the morning. But there was a, a mention of a Tesla story, and the joke he was making, let's see, was uh, saying Elon is going to claim Asimov's three laws in the handbook of robotics is woke, and that's why his robots are attacking suspected union organizers at Tesla. Okay, well, that spells it out a little bit better. What? Why? What are we thinking of here? This is a report from the Daily Beast. Let's see what this is. A Tesla robot attacked engineer with its claws, according to a report. Whose report? Well, not the Daily Beast's report. They're just stealing it from someone else, I guess. And we'll go find out uh, who got uh, uh, borrowed from in the literary sense. Uh, here, huh? what's going on here? Uh, Chaya Tong is... Uh, reporting this as the, this is an interesting title, the Breaking News Intern. Uh, so if news is breaking, they give it to an intern, and that way, if it never gets fixed, 
they can blame the intern on this, but I guess a, a, a production robot, a, you know, one of the robots they use in manufacturing Teslas. I don't know what happened. It went crazy or someone stuck their hand in it or something. A robot at Tesla allegedly attacked an engineer, stabbing its metal claws into his back and arm, leaving a trail of blood on the machinery. Well, it's not the fault of the blood. It just falls wherever it's spilled. This according to a 2021 injury report. So it's actually a while ago. Um, was that before we knew that Elon Musk was completely nuts? I mean, he was just partially nuts at that point, right? He didn't own Twitter, for instance. But it's a resurfaced incident that comes amid new concerns over automated technology and reports of injuries in Tesla's factories that have given that have been allegedly swept under the rug. I guess now re-examining the Elon Musk record and legacy uh, in light of his craziness. The 2021 report said that the worker was given no time off from work, despite eyewitness accounts saying that the engineer was severely injured. We've had multiple workers who were injured and one worker who died, whose injuries or death are not in these reports that Tesla is supposed to be accurately completing and submitting to the county in order to get tax incentives. Jeez, that's a pretty... That's a bleak bottom line for everything. This is according to Hannah Alexander, an attorney for the nonprofit Workers Defense Project. So there you go. Uh, there's a link to where they picked up the story from. And uh, I don't know whether we'll be interested or disappointed to find out that it's the Daily Mail. I mean, ordinarily, you wouldn't necessarily expect them to pick that story up, but they've decided to do it anyway. Uh, so that's, you know, interesting. I'd like to know more about it. I just don't think the Daily Mail is the place to turn for it. But like w when you say that somebody was attacked by a robot, well, you know, I think movie scene, like, oh, my gosh, you can I totally understand being attacked by the robot seen Terminator or I don't know, some sort of other weird uh, science fiction film in which people are attacked by robots. Sure. But the robots in those movies, well, they're humanoid looking robots usually. And the robots in a uh, auto production facility, rarely so. And it just seems like uh, usually also they're, you know, they're, they're limited in, in the space in which they can move. They're affixed to the, to the floor or something nearby their station where they perform their tasks. And the idea of being attacked by one of them uh, requires some explanation. And it makes me think like, well, if you get in the way of one of those robots, you could get stuck by its claws. But when you say attacked by, uh, I'm curious, but I'm curious to find out from someone other than the Daily Mail, I guess. But I don't know. All right. You, you caught me. I'll, I'll click on the thing and see. Uh, is this a contemporaneous report or this? No, this is a current report, I guess, about the fact that they've unearthed this. I don't see how it could be a contemporaneous report if they were covering it up. It happened in a factory in Texas. So I guess also, you know, Texas. Who cares? Because we don't uh, enforce laws around here because of freedom, I guess. Um, hmm, I don't know. I mean, I, I hesitate to, to, to invest any time in learning facts from the Daily Mail. But... Let's see what's going on here. I'll see what they say about it. Uh, the robot had pinned the man who was then programming software for two disabled Tesla robots nearby before sinking its metal claws into the worker's back and arm. Again, there's the leaving the trail of blood along the factory surface. I have no doubt that you can leave a trail of blood along the, the factory floor. But uh, again, it just... I don't know. I guess you'd have to see uh, a more technical explanation and or some video. But I guess if he's got a line of these robots that he's programming and I don't know, you, you accidentally, I, I don't know what, I can't really explain it. But anyway, uh, who knows? There you go. Uh, Tesla in the news for having covered up news about injured workers. And I guess the uh, the additional information that the Daily Beast was trying to get across to us is that uh, is was the, was it uh, the Daily Beast bringing this news to it or was it what uh, Justice was pointing to? 
that um oh yeah that uh, it was oh maybe that was the joke was that it was a union organizers a suspected union organizers okay but they would be the next targets i guess of these crazed robots all right i see now i'm getting the picture the other one i don't know and uh, we'll just let uh, we'll see whether justice picks this one up and uh, well, maybe you guys know what he's talking about. Let's see. What if it's the other way around and it's De Niro who refuses to work with Jim, uh, Ka- what's his name? Cavizel. Uh, and here I profess, uh, to be completely lost in all of this. All right. At any rate, I knew that there were other things I wanted to get to somewhere. It was pocket and I have tucked away a number of other fun things for discussion. I'll see. Uh, one, came up briefly in talking with Greg, the collapse of Moms for Liberty. And that uh, story was kicked along further over the weekend with what I guess was the discovery of, uh, and the way it put it in the headlines that I saw, a second sex tape involving the leadership, of the founding leadership of Moms for Liberty. This is the same story that we heard about down in Florida the other day, but then I said, wow, a second sex tape, that's incredible, but also, was there a first sex tape? And I did not know, I knew that there was a a a, a situation in which the founders found themselves, put themselves into, that they were into some kind of, uh, hey, it's their business, not ours, except if they're incredible hypocrites and moral scolds, into some sort of three-way sexual relationship and made worse by the fact that the wife decided not to participate one day in a scheduled meetup and husband went anyway and the other woman not interested if the wife wasn't there. You remember the, the background and said, too bad, uh, we're doing this anyway. And, and the allegation is that from the woman, the accusation is that she, uh, was then, well, that he then raped her and, uh, but on top of all of that, even if it had been consensual, it probably would have created a sensation for such moral scolds as the Moms for Liberty uh, people and uh, these conservative activists. And now I find out that there's a tape of some kind. I, like There was no allegation that I recall of there being a first sex tape, just a rape, which, you know, stands quite apart from whether or not there's tape. But anyway, it turns out that there were some recordings i guess they got a hold of uh one of the phones and golly gee there was a sex tape and uh, i don't know maybe is, is it worth explaining that story or maybe what here's what we'll do we'll go and said to amanda marcotte who uh, is uh, well qualified to handle dispensing with moral scolds who turn out to be hypocrites and see what kind of summation she gives to the story before then you know taking the bad actors apart, as is usually the case. She writes, the GOP's biggest loser of 2023, Moms for Liberty, has us asking how many sex tapes are there? I, you know, that wasn't normally going to be my question. Uh, and it's probably not even really Amanda's actual question, but it's just fun to note that uh, now we have to ask that about Moms for Liberty. Uh, let's see what's going on here. Amid a growing sex scandal, founder Bridget Ziegler was con- just confronted by a gay student who, I guess, uh, called her out on her moral scold stuff. Let's see. Uh, oh, this is the second in a five-day series, as it turns out. What was part one about? There's a link here. Um, oh, okay. Uh, a year-end series of the biggest, the GOP's biggest losers of 2023. Yesterday's installation, therefore, uh, was uh, Kevin McCarthy. But now we'll focus on Moms for Liberty and hope that they really are the biggest losers of the year or among them. Bridget Ziegler co-founded Moms for Liberty with the goal of transforming staid school board meetings into high-octane right-wing agitprop. So it's fitting that her comeuppance arrived in the form of being read for filth to her face at a Sarasota County school board meeting by one of her many victims, Gay former public school student Xander Moritz in a clip that went viral in mid-December. I missed it entirely, but, uh, you know, it was a busy time. Uh, the 
clip, I guess, is here in this embedded tweet from the Tennessee Holler. Florida students wildly hip uh, schools wildly hypocritical moms against parenthetically against liberty founder bridget ziegler you don't believe in public schools you send your kids to private you deserve to be fired not because of a threesome but because you are terrible at it not at the threesome although she may also be terrible at that uh, but rather terrible at being on the school board and the clip is embedded here i haven't seen it but uh, by all accounts well received and widely circulated. On top of founding the infamous pro censorship group, Ziegler has been serving as a school board member while also working closely with Governor Ron DeSantis to pass not- the notorious Don't Say Gay law meant to put public school teachers and students back in the closet. She's also been busy with at least one same sex encounter of her own. Womp womp. Admitting to police that she had a three way with another woman and her husband, Christian Ziegler the chair of Florida's state Republican Party, if you need to be reminded. Police are involved, of course, because the other woman has accused Christian Ziegler of raping her in alleged retaliation after she declined to have sex with him without his wife present. My oh my, that's an unusual twist, don't you think? Anyway, since there's no limit to Christian right hypocrisy, readers will not be surprised to hear that the couple who would ban books for others allegedly felt no shame about creating hardcore porn for themselves. Police reportedly recovered a video of Christian Ziegler and the accuser having sex. My oh my. Now, sources say police have a second video of Bridget in bed with the unnamed woman. She was doing this while also terrorizing teachers for in uh, terrorizing teachers. What in Florida, I guess, for advertising non-explicit LGBTQ affirming events. So, all right, that's a fancy way of saying while chasing people down and scolding them for uh, for even being LGBTQ, much less just trying to make a more comfortable atmosphere for people who are. She was well engaging in that activity herself. You know, just for fun. Anyway, the quote here, I guess, from that viral video, you do not deserve to be removed from it, the school board, for having a threesome. Um, Moritz declared to Bridget Ziegler's face right there and then in one of the most satisfying speeches of the year. That defeats the lesson we've been trying to teach you, which is that it is a politician's job to serve their community, not police their personal lives. Bridget... You deserve to be fired from your job because you're terrible at your job, he concluded, not because you had sex with a woman. A master class in going low to go high, Moritz managed to use Ziegler's sex life to humiliate her while making a larger point against using sex as a weapon against ordinary people. It was also a fitting obituary for Moms for Liberty, which may limp on in for some time as an organization, but whose political power is disappearing along with Bridget Ziegler's ability to keep up the Chaste Church Lady Act. It seems harder to believe today, but two years ago, Moms for Liberty was widely regarded as the great electoral hope of the Republican Party. The pro-censorship anti-mask group was founded in Florida in January of 2021 by far-right Republican uh, activists, including Ziegler, passing themselves off as mere, quote, concerned mothers. The ostensible target was public schools demonized for woke curricula and temporary public health measures to control the spread of COVID-19. The real goal? Republican victories in state and national elections. The moms targeted school board meetings in swing states, throwing tantrums over made-up threats like critical race theory, which is just a scare term for teaching the histories of segregation and slavery, or to scream about groomers, a slur authoritarians use to falsely imply LGBTQ teachers are sexual predators. The theatrics would garner local news coverage and social media play, creating the illusion that schools were out of control with political correctness. The hope was to stir up a moral panic that would lead to swing districts electing Republicans all the way up to the White House. And now I'm glad that we then transition to this because this will help us make our point. Keep in mind what Greg just told us about what Tennessee parents are facing from their own Republican state legislators when it really is time to listen to parents. All of a sudden, when the issue is guns, uh, 
parents, go screw yourselves. We're not interested. But remember, this is supposed to be their whole platform. Uh, back to the way Amanda is describing it. Uh, the real goal, of course, right, to try and win Republican victories in state and national elections. And for instance, in November of 2021, Moms for Liberty scored big when Republican Glenn Youngkin won Virginia's gubernatorial race, running on a platform of annoyance over pandemic restrictions and fury that black authors like Toni Morrison were being assigned in English class. Uh, plus, of course, local conditions with the sexual assaults that happened in the Latin, well, the one perpetrator's sexual assaults, uh, and it being poorly handled, I suppose, here in Loudoun County. But that all translated into listen to parents when they want to come and scream at you about various things, except for if it's the things that we like. Uh, and then it turns out that, well, if you use the Ziegler's as an example, the, the things that Republicans had left on their list that were permissible to come and scream at school boards about are, in fact, things that they like. Hmm. That's the weird hypocrisy of it all. But, well, guns, those are the things we'll uh, admit to liking in public, whereas you're going to have to force it out of us by confiscating our phones and showing videotape of us liking those other things. Anyway, uh, so, yes, this uh, the the win in, in November of 21 for Glenn Youngkin, created a veritable mania in the GOP, which hoped that racist and homophobic panic, as well as lingering pandemic resentments, could be the key to winning over mothers of school-age children, a group that had been trending left in the Donald Trump era. Moms for Liberty was lavished with money, attention, and acclaim, all in the hopes that their book-banning mania would be the key that unlocked future Republican victories. There was always a good reason to be skeptical that the moms were all they were cracked up to be. Post-election data showed that Yunkin did not actually get a surge of votes from parents angry about woke schools, but because elderly white people who were angry over Trump's loss turned out in large numbers, while other demographics, no doubt sick of politics, stayed home. Nor was there any evidence that the public had developed a sudden enthusiasm for censorship, as polls showed 83 to 87% of voters opposed the Moms for Liberty style book bans. Plus, common sense should have warned that they were wrong to believe Americans wished to continually relitigate the mask wars after the pandemic's end. Sure enough, Moms for Liberty never made good on its promise to spin electoral gold out of culture war straw, the story of the past couple of years has been how much voters reject Christian right busybodies trying to control our sex lives, our reading material, and our right to ignore some unhinged church lady screaming about how the queers are trying to critically race theorize her precious white children. Moms linked candidates who snuck onto school boards were voted out. Republicans underperformed in most elections. Instead, Voters were driven by support for abortion rights, which stands in for a whole constellation of mind-your-own-business Karen attitudes in the public. It's almost too good to be true that the already wounded organization would meet its end with a sex scandal. As most people who follow politics know, the Republicans out there making the biggest stink about the supposedly sinful sex lives of others tend to have overstuffed closets of illicit secrets themselves. No doubt there are still some liberals who are anxious about talking about the Ziegler's love of three ways, fearing it violates the principle of not using people's private lives as sec political weapons. But as Moritz deftly illustrated, there is one loophole. When a person has built a career on shaming and policing the sex lives of private citizens, feel free to go ham when you discover there's video evidence that they love three ways. Perhaps... The lesson here is simple. Any Republican who wants to monitor our sex lives or reading habits must first hand in their iPhone library over for public inspection. That would invite a blessed silence from the would-be arbiters of sexual morality. Yeah, well, you can't force them to do it right up front. So, you know, they'll continue to keep on hiding it, hoping that uh, they can just uh, go on their merry way being undiscovered and in the meantime make your lives miserable. So they're not going to be forced to hand them over. That's too bad. Wishful thinking, but it would be nice. All right, let's see. Other things that we ought to uh, perhaps 
throw in here for discussion. I think we uh, kind of, uh, well, we made some discussion of it uh, early on when Greg was on just talking about uh, how I would dispute the characterization of what happened uh, in the courts or, well, I guess what didn't happen in the courts, at least when you're talking about the SCOTUS over the weekend. But let's see. Um, there's still quite a few uh, angles uh, to discuss on this and a lot of uh, people wanting to weigh in on it. Let's see. Why don't we throw this in before the break? There was, hmm, how can we, uh, what's a good way to introduce this? Um, well, how about we do it this way? Going to the Colorado case. I mean, I think we spent uh, most of our time talking about the SCOTUS declination, let's say, to hear the Jack Smith motion on an expedited basis. But I think we've pretty well covered that one. Not a gamble and not a big setback, just uh, n not a not an accurate portrayal of what happened there. But we didn't focus that much on what happened in the Colorado Supreme Court. So uh, a couple of good angles being offered on it. And this will run us over the break, I'm sure. But first, uh, it always worth looking at what Steve Vladek has to say about these things. And uh, I think we, I don't know, do we, I probably didn't have an opportunity to discuss this. But um, in his own Substack, he's still on Substack, uh, piece on the question, let's see, the law and high politics of disqualifying President Trump. Why does he title this one Bonus 58? I'm not sure, but... Uh, at any rate, uh, whether courts can disqualify presidential candidates under Section 3 of the 14th Amendment is a legal and political minefield that the U.S. Supreme Court will now have to navigate. This is his piece from probably, what was that, Friday the 21st? Uh, although, I don't know, it seems like it's earlier than that. Wasn't Friday the yeah 22nd? I don't know. I, I've lost track. As you know, my calendar's a wreck. Uh, anyway, seems like an age ago. Welcome back to One First. That's his substack, a twice weekly newsletter that aims to make the U.S. Supreme Court more accessible to all of us. Terrific, right? Usually the Thursday issue. Ah, OK, there's the answer. The 21st is reserved for bonus content. Get it for paid subscribers as opposed to the free content that comes out every Monday. But given the developments of the week, it seemed appropriate to do a second free post. This one focused on Tuesday's major ruling from the Colorado Supreme Court. Major, major ruling. Which held that former President Trump is disqualified from holding future federal office by Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. As I explained in the post that follows, the decision, whatever its merits, puts the U.S. Supreme Court in an incredibly difficult position, one I suspect justices from across the ideological spectrum were very much hoping to avoid, and it drives home the very real tension that can arise between pure legal analysis and high constitutional politics, especially in these kinds of novel constitutional disputes with enormous practical stakes. I hope that you'll consider subscribing. He says, and I hope you'll consider subscribing as well, sub, his sub stack, or, well, wherever he goes eventually, whether he stays there or not, Vladek deserves support just as we do, and we thank you very much for stepping in, all of you, to provide that support. To briefly recap, he says, as he asks for your support, the Colorado Supreme Court, pictured below, oh, that's nice, uh, ruled on Tuesday that former President Trump is ineligible to hold any federal office, including the presidency, because he engaged in insurrection through his conduct leading up to and on January 6th, 2021, and because Section 3 applies to the presidency and not just other federal offices. Four of the court's seven justices joined in the unsigned majority opinion. Oh, I got to get the pop up out of the way here. Um, the three dissents objected in various ways to the majority reaching the substantive questions it decided, but none took specific issue with how those questions were resolved. I guess once you get there, it's just a question of where you're supposed to resolve them at all. Critically, and a bunch of media outlets bungled this, at least initially, the decision does not go into immediate effect. Important to remember the Colorado Supreme Court stayed its ruling until January 4th, although that is rapidly approaching, and 
if Trump seeks review from the U.S. Supreme Court by then, stays it indefinitely until the U.S. Supreme Court resolves Trump's appeal. Given that the ballot printing deadline for the primary election in Colorado is January 5th, which is certainly not a coincidence, the stay all but guarantees that Trump will be on the Republican primary ballot in Colorado. The real question is, what happens thereafter? So if you find yourself surprised to see him on the ballot at that point, well, now you'll know exactly how that happened. I also think it is inevitable that the U.S. Supreme Court will step in. The stay just means that it won't have to do anything immediately and can take up the matter on an expedited but not insanely compressed schedule. The other, in other words, rather, the court could plan to resolve the case by the end of its current term, that would be June, and the decision would come in time to resolve whether Trump could appear on the general election ballot in Colorado. The court will likely want to move faster than that. The point is that it has months, not weeks, to do so. All right. Well, we will continue with his view of this and take a look at it from a couple other angles after this. Sup, fam? It's your boy Darwin, a.k.a. Darwin underscore Darko, a.k.a. the most reasonable man in America, a.k.a. KITM's senior black correspondent. You might remember me from such recordings as Spacemen vs. Space Cadets and We Need to Talk About Joe Biden. Today, I want to bring you good news about that thing you've been struggling with. Do you suffer from giving too much of a damn? Do you turn on the series of tubes and find yourself outraged at the particular way some news organization strung some sentences together only to realize, nope, this is not some fictional hellscape? Well, guess what? You no longer have to accept the life of giving too much of a damn. You can do something about it because even you, yes you, can be a show contributor. Now I know what you're thinking. Hey, Mr. Most Reasonable Man in America, I'm not some professional podcast talking guy. Don't worry about it. Do you have a smartphone or some other electronic recording device? Well, that's all you need. You too can have a segment where you can read us an important article and give us your take. Read one of your own original essays or even just give us your commentary on something you'd like to share that's important to you. Fair warning though, side effects may include general punditry, having opinions and hot takes, getting stuff off your chest, and hearing your own voice. If your recording lasts longer than five to seven minutes, please consult kagorx at gmail.com. That's K-A-G-R-O-X at gmail.com. All right, welcome back now to the Kagor in the Morning Show here on Netroots Radio. All right, we'll jump right back in to Steve Vladek discussing the Colorado Supreme Court situation and uh, probably add a few more voices to the collection before concluding for the day. And then we'll see what uh, kind of time we have left. Uh, But there's an awful lot to get to. Okay. So where do we leave off with this? Um, Right. We were in the middle, I think, of this paragraph, which Vladek told us, okay, it is inevitable probably that the U.S. Supreme Court will, in fact, step in in the Colorado disqualification case. It's uh, simply a question of when, uh, but uh, probably before the end of their term, as he said, in June, uh, which means that it is entirely likely that the when the ballots are certainly when the ballots are printed, whether or not it's the case when the primary actually comes around in Colorado, uh, Trump will likely be on the ballot that won't be resolved. Uh, but the question of whether or not he can be on the general election ballot gives the court slightly more time. Uh, to weigh in and uh, possibly be the cause of his appearing or not appearing in Colorado and possibly elsewhere. So waiting for the issue to resurface during the general election cycle is just kicking the can down the road. And to quote from the exceptions to mootness doctrine, this case otherwise would sure seem capable of repetition, yet evading review. I know that's a little... uh, esoteric for those not uh, currently in law school, perhaps we're currently teaching there. But as for what the Supreme Court is going to do or should do, that's where I must confess being profoundly torn. I believe that each of the following seven points are true. And I guess he's signaling to us that some of them may be internally contradictory or at least contradict one another. One, President Trump did in fact engage in insurrection through his efforts, both before and on January 6th, 
to encourage the use of both subterfuge and force to subvert the results of the 2020 presidential election and to prevent the transition of power to his duly elected political opponent. Point one. Point two. Section three of the 14th Amendment applies to the presidency. Robert E. Lee could not have run for president in 1868. And the clever dodge that was perhaps designed to force a a quick review by the Colorado Supreme Court more than anything else, but the dodge employed by and knowingly employed by the uh, trial court in Colorado doesn't really hold up to further inspection, I would add. But I think that's supposed to be implicit in his quick point here. Uh, Third point, section three is self-executing, meaning that it can be enforced without some prior adjudicative proceeding like a criminal prosecution. That's what allowed the House and the Senate to refuse to seat putative members elected from southern states who they determined had engaged in insurrection during the Civil War. And there's also the last sentence of Section 3, which empowers Congress to remove that disability uh, that had presumably previously applied. It doesn't say by what means it applies. And that's where we, I think, draw the conclusion of its self-executing nature. If it's obvious to all, then the Congress can opt to remove it or they can opt to uh, continue to recognize it and say, sorry, we just don't accept your credentials. You can't be sworn into the House. Fourth point, the full Supreme Court has never decided any of those first three issues. Fifth point, The Supreme Court will not, and in my view should not, let a single state Supreme Court have the last word on the first three issues. Point six, there are significant chunks of the American populace that will find it very hard to respect a Supreme Court decision that keeps Trump off of the ballot. And point seven, that there are significant chunks of the American populace that will find it very hard to respect a Supreme Court decision that keeps Trump on the ballot. It's a tough question. It's just, I guess, one, shouldn't they be doing the right thing, legally speaking, reading the law and just say, if somebody's going to be disappointed, they might as well be the one who are reading, the ones who are reading the law incorrectly. And two, eh, it probably wouldn't hurt things to find out that the chunk that will be upset with keeping him off the ballot is actually smaller than the chunk who would be upset with leaving him on the ballot, but okay. Now, against that backdrop, the Supreme Court is stuck between a rock and a hard place, even without regard to how the justices might want to resolve those first three questions. Remember those first three questions. uh, Did he engage in insurrection? Does the 14th Amendment apply to the presidency? And is it self-executing? So, uh, SCOTUS will be stuck between a rock and a hard place without how, without regard even to how the justices might want to resolve those first three questions. Some of that is a problem of the justices' own making. A court with more credibility and it was even less, seen less as a partisan lightning rod would presumably have had far more capital to spend even in such highly charged and deeply fraught election cases. Capital that, for example, allowed the Supreme Court circa 2000 to decide Bush v. Gore and get away with it. Some of it is a problem of the Senate's making, since it would have taken just nine more Republican senators to spare all of us from this mess, maybe, uh, by voting to convict and disqualify Trump for the same underlying conduct during his second impeachment trial in 2021. Uh, the, the, the issue there is... Uh, you know, if Trump is just going to act extra constitutionally all the time, who knows what he would be saying and what he would be arguing with respect to disqualification under the impeachment clause. Well, it doesn't work. It's just not real. No, I, I'm going to run anyway. Well, you can't. Well, who's, can you? Can't. Is, is, is that really true? Can you, can, can you really be self-executingly denied? You know, can we really self-execute this denial of ballot access? Uh, wouldn't he be appealing to Republican secretaries of state to simply ignore the verdict in the Senate? Would they? I don't know. Not sure. It's hard to tell. Anyway, back to what Vladek is talking about. Some of it might be also a problem of Jack Smith's making since the criminal indictment against former President Trump arising out of the January 6th case pointedly does not 
include an insurrection charge, which we keep arguing here that it should, a conviction on which would have itself disqualified Trump, and some of it is a problem of a distressingly large subset of the populace's making. By not viewing Trump's behavior as the categorical bar it really ought to be to supporting his reelection bid. But whoever's fault it is, it is now the Supreme Court that is left to navigate this swamp. Perhaps there are four votes to affirm the Colorado Supreme Court. Perhaps there are even five. But it's hard to believe that there are six, or certainly nine. Some may view that as a damning indictment of some of the justices. I take the point. But what if it simply reflects that at least some of these legal questions are debatable? That's where this becomes, at least in part, a conversation about high politics. I've written before, he says, about the court's 1974 decision in the Watergate tapes cases, U.S. v. Nixon. There, an 8-0 to zero majority, with then-Justice Rehnquist recused, in an opinion under the name of Chief Justice Warren Burger. Nixon's hand-picked successor to Earl Warren, uh, ruled there that Nixon could not use the executive privilege as a shield against complying with the grand jury subpoena, seeking tapes from the secret recording system in the White House. The subsequent release of one of those tapes, the smoking gun tape, ex uh, spelled the end of any political support for Nixon and helped precipitate his resignation just 16 days after the court's decision. Although there had been some discussion in Nixon's camp about refusing to comply with an adverse Supreme Court ruling, the fact that it was unanimous and penned ostensibly by Berger himself poured cold water on the idea. I don't know if there's any water cold enough for Donald Trump, though. I would add. The Supreme Court's disposition in Nixon is generally viewed as a in a positive light, at least as an example of the court living up to its highest institutional purposes. In a 2016 speech, then judge on the uh, D.C. Circuit, right, not yet a Supreme Court justice, but a judge, then Judge Brett Kavanaugh in 2016 counted it as one of the greatest moments in judicial American judicial history. But the dirty little secret of the ruling itself is that its analysis reflects a series of deeply unsettling and unpersuasive compromises. The court unnecessarily went out of its way to recognize a constitutionally grounded executive privilege without a ton of analytical support in a context in which it could have assumed its existence without establishing it and then held that this privilege had to give way to the prosecution's never before and never since recognized interest in having access to potentially inculpatory evidence. It was, as analytical coherence goes, a middling effort at best, and subsequent reports have suggested, unsurprisingly, that different coalitions of justices, seldom including Berger, were responsible for the different passages. But nobody much cared because the court was unanimous and it ruled unanimously against Nixon and, ironically, for the institution of the presidency. One can tell a similar story about Brown and other landmark cases in which the court traded analytical sophistication for unanimity or at least cross-ideological majorities, where the message the court sent was more important than the specific analysis that it provided. The cases, These cases are not departures from the rule of law. They are the epitome of it, reflecting a nuanced and complicated understanding of exactly what that contestable concept really means. The upshot of these cases is that there are moments where the Supreme Court is doing more than just law, and that's in scare quotes. That is, it's doing high constitutional politics. And those moments tend to involve cases in which the country would be best served by rulings that appeal across the political and or ideological spectrum. The court has badly flubbed some of these moments. See, for example, Bush v. Gore. Uh, but that only reinforces the consequences for the court of not taking the high politics of these kinds of cases seriously. There's an obvious response to this, and it's also something I've written about before. The idea that the law ought to be the first, last, and everything in between. Let justice be done, though the heavens fall. That's a quote from where I forget, but I get that argument, even if I disagree with it. 
But what complicates matters even further for the current court is that this mantra has in recent times become the mantra of conservatives who have defended originalism and other features of their contemporary judicial philosophy on grounds, however persuasive, of ideological purity and apoliticalness. Here, in the flesh, is a powerful example of a dispute in which it will be impossible for the court to not be perceived as political. And so the focus shifts to whether the court can issue a decision that avoids being perceived as partisan. Then there's a difference there. If you find any of this discussion remotely persuasive, and I expect and respect that many will not, then the question becomes how the current Supreme Court could resolve the Section 3 issue in a way that is not perceived as partisan, and that doesn't further inflame the toxic politics of the 2024 election cycle, and or further undermine the court's credibility. At risk, at the risk of sticking my neck out, I think there's one possible approach here. And then again, this is Steve Laddick. Not necessarily me, but let's see what he has to say. For a majority of the court to conclude that the president did engage in insurrection, but that there is some impediment, self-execution, Section 3 not applying to the presidency, etc., that prevents the courts from providing a remedy for his misconduct. Indeed, this is exactly how the trial court had ruled in the Colorado case. Folks might also recognize the parallel to how Chief Justice Marshall navigated the sticky political wicket in Marbury. And that has come to mind for me personally uh, lately. The point is not that this is the most persuasive legal position. Parenthetically, he adds, I don't find the arguments about Section 3 exempting the presidency or not being self or exempting the presidency or not being self-executing, especially persuasive as a textural or structural matter. It's that it's the closest thing for the court to a win-win. The court won't be keeping Trump off the ballot, but it won't be endorsing his candidacy either. If anything, having Republican appointees joining Democratic appointees and holding that Trump did engage in insurrection might go a long way toward persuading those who are capable of being persuaded to cast their vote for someone else. All the while, the Supreme Court would dodge blame for either endorsing Trump's candidacy or precluding it, a ruling that would make no one perfectly happy, but that would reflect the kind of high political compromise that, in some of its finest moments, the Supreme Court has embraced. I don't know if this would be a fine moment, but I get his point. Uh, no, it won't make any particular logical or legal sense, but it might be the only conclusion they can come to. We can't justify it, but we're saying it anyway and thinking it might be the best possible outcome. I don't know if I agree, but that might be their aim in doing this. I, although how you conclude that he did engage in insurrection, but it somehow doesn't apply to him. Well, okay. Uh, it makes no logical sense, but they might just rule that way, even though the Colorado Supreme Court just said that it was an error to do so. They may overrule them. I don't say any of this by way of a prediction, Vladek says, but rather solely as a means of illustrating two overlapping points. The first is that this is a much messier case for the Supreme Court than I think a lot of folks of all political stripes are appreciating. And the second is that we should be willing to admit that high politics is part of what the Supreme Court does. And that's not necessarily an indictment. After all, the court is but one part of our federal system and owes responsibility not just to the law as an abstraction, but to those institutions from which its formal and practical power derives. As I wrote back in November, if the heavens fall in response to the justice done today, how can justice be done tomorrow? Hmm. I see. There might be answers to that question. At the moment, though, I don't have them. Okay. That's a good point, right? Let justice be done, though the heavens may fall. Okay. I can understand and appreciate that. Okay. But if the heavens do fall, how will justice be done tomorrow? I don't know. Under some new system? Not at all, perhaps? I guess the implication is, well, not at all. So, uh, of what good is that? Uh, well, that's a good question. And there might be no good answer to it, as he points out. Okay. Let's see. Another, um, 
approach on this that I wanted to add, or I thought uh, in my quick skim looked like it might be worth adding Chris Geidner's thoughts from his lawdork.com uh, newsletter or daily reportage, depending. I don't know how what he terms it there. But at any rate, with Trump cases, he says, the courts must now play their role in accountability. It is not, as he says, anti-democratic to use the tools of our government to hold a person accountable for past anti-democratic actions. A slightly different avenue here and a different focus. This was something widely debated over the weekend. Um, a lot of people, well, actually all during the week, from Tuesday onward after the Colorado Supreme Court decision, a lot of bad punditry in particular, I thought, uh, saying that it was a terrible outcome because it was anti-democratic somehow to not simply leave it to the voters. But as we sort of expressed, as I expressed uh, last week, um, it's not surprising that such a thing might be enshrined in the Constitution. That's where we enshrine... Uh, writ constitutions are a place where we would enshrine things that aren't perhaps necessarily democratic in nature. So the few anti-democratic things that we enshrine as good in this country and try to keep beyond uh, populist influence by enshrining them in a written constitution. That's the point of doing them, though they may be unpopular at some point uh, now or in the future. They were considered so important and so basic to the ongoing survival of democratic or at least quasi-democratic society that they would be protected from the whims of the voters. No wonder they're anti-democratic. They were meant to be. No wonder they were written down. They were written down so that they weren't mistaken and swept aside in populist fervor later on. That's sort of a one theory of constitution building and what it's all about. But let's stick with Chris Geidner's view of things for right now. The Supreme Court on Friday last refused special counsel Jack Smith's request to fast track questions about whether Donald Trump can claim that presidential immunity bars his prosecution in federal court in D.C. This understandably set off a flurry of responses the second time this week that a court ruling appeared to directly affect the upcoming 2024 presidential election. The first obviously was that Colorado Supreme Court ruling on December 19th that Trump is disqualified from being president and cannot therefore appear on the state's presidential primary ballot. These are complicated questions, and those who stress that are right, but courts resolve complicated questions all the time. The number of people suddenly acting like courts can't resolve novel or complex situations and questions and can't do so without substantial time to do so is embarrassing or disingenuous or both. Uh, agreed there, and I don't think Vladek disagrees either. Uh, he's just reminding you that sometimes the way they choose to resolve them are uh, political and otherwise nonsensical, but they happen anyway. And sometimes for the purpose of allowing uh, justice to be done tomorrow and or not having the heavens fall. A serious underlying question here, Chris continues, is about whether and how our nation responds to anti-democratic actions. Our system of government has set in place several tools for holding people accountable for such actions, and it's not anti-democratic to use them. It does not make them the only option for moving forward, but they are there for a reason. The coming month, and likely months, will provide test after test for the Supreme Court on down to... Uh, on. Hmm. The Supreme Court on down, I see. Test after test for the Supreme Court on down, the entire court system, that is to say, as to whether our courts are willing and able to play their essential role in our system in a way that is forthright, timely, and allows for that accountability where it is being sought. He goes on to say the courts can do this. First, as to Friday's Supreme Court order, U.S. District Judge Tanya Chutkin earlier ruled that Trump cannot have his federal D.C. case dismissed on the presidential immunity ground, nor can his case be dismissed on the ground that double jeopardy principles prevent his prosecution for his actions related to January 6, 2021, because the Senate failed to convict him in his second impeachment. Trump has appealed that decision to the U.S. Court of Appeals for the D.C. Circuit. Smith asked the justices to skip over that court and definitively resolve these questions, but the court, in a one-sentence order, said no. Regardless of that, though, 
The D.C. Circuit was already set to hear arguments on the immunity and related questions on January 9th. That appeals court has provided quick rulings in these matters, and there's no reason, given the expedited nature of this appeal, that they won't do so here. Some have expressed concern that Trump could then seek to delay the proceedings further. He could seek to do so. But the appeals court could also take actions in association with the ruling to keep moving things forward more quickly. And the Supreme Court absolutely could still hear arguments in the case this term. If Chutkin's ruling is affirmed by the D.C. Circuit, the justices could even again deny cert if Trump appeals, ending the case. I hinted at that earlier. Whether they would do that or not, I do not know. But they could, and it wouldn't look any different. Now, while possible, I do not think, Chris says, that it would be strange for the justices not to definitively resolve novel constitutional claims raised by a former president in relation to a prosecution of that former president. But quick review of those questions could happen. With the Colorado case, we're simply facing a set of questions about what the justices will do and on what timeline they'll do it. Trump has to seek Supreme Court review of the Colorado Supreme Court's decision by January 4th. If he does so, the Colorado Supreme Court's ruling will remain stayed until the receipt of any order or mandate from the U.S. Supreme Court. In other words, the Supreme Court could theoretically just moot out the case by not issuing an order before the primary. They could do that, but it would not moot the issue because it would return, even in Colorado, for the general election, as well as potentially in other states. If the court does nothing to rule before the primary, it could also be seen, and rightly so, as effectively ruling on the issue without technically doing so, as the court did the night that Texas's SB8 abortion ban went into effect. A lot of this is up in the air. The courts could, in effect, allow Trump's obvious efforts to delay any criminal trials from taking place before the election to succeed. They similarly could avoid ruling against Trump on the 14th Amendment matter on any number of grounds framed either as technical decisions or decisions attempting to keep the courts out of it. With either set of issues, though, the courts can still address and answer the necessary questions in time to get all Trump-related cases resolved when needed. I know this because I have watched for the past decade as state and federal courts do so, sometimes weekly or even twice a week, with people's actual lives. Complex, novel legal issues are often resolved in death penalty cases before state Supreme Courts, federal district and appeals courts, and the U.S. Supreme Court in matters of days or even hours. The U.S. Supreme Court, this court in particular, has made it clear that it can resolve almost any capital case issue in whatever time it's given. They do so even though the result, again, from this court in particular, generally means that a person is dead within an hour or two of the high court's decision. And yet, when it comes to Trump's criminal and constitutional woes today, a lot of people are writing a lot of words that can make it sound like they think it's just all too complicated to resolve this quickly. Well... As uh, Greg sometimes says, that's bullshit. That's right. And I think everyone will see that if they just stop for a minute, everyone will see that and realize the courts regularly resolve literal life and death cases in hours sometimes. There's still more. We know very well what this fight is about, it says. I am not denying the big picture, though. This is a difficult moment for the Supreme Court. I get that. I would argue that much of that is the court's own making due to the way the Roberts court has frittered away its reputational capital in recent years. Second person to say so today. But I'll keep those issues aside for now. People on the left, middle, and center are fired up about one aspect of this or another, and they're not wrong to be. In one instance, Stephen Maisie and Stephen Fladdock urged in the New York Times on Saturday for an exercise of the art of judicial statecraft as part of their attempt to nudge the court to somehow split the difference in the cases, a quote from that article, a universe in which the court somehow splits the difference, for example, keeping Trump on the ballot while refusing to endorse, if not affirmatively repudiating his conduct and spurning his king-like claim to total immunity, could go a long way toward reducing the temperature of the coming election cycle. Such an outcome could also help restore at least some of the court's credibility. I don't know. I have to think... Chris says, or hope, that the reason Maisie and Vladek wrote this, even if they don't say so directly, 
is because they don't think the court will uphold the Colorado Supreme Court's ruling. So they're setting up a possible outcome that would at least keep the special counsel's case moving forward on a quick enough schedule. If not that, I don't get it. Why is this interpretation of the post-Civil War amendments and application of one of those amendments provisions to a man who sought to ignore and overturn a presidential election? Why is this the time when a legal journalist and law professor are urging the court to do something other than rule on the important cases on their merits? Sherilyn Eiffel, former head of the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund, has been talking about this issue on threads, although directly replying to a piece by Vox's Ian Milheiser below, I think this response captures the essence of a lot of the smart arguments that she has been making. And we'll sneak one more such argument in, and then we got to skip out for the day and promise you that there's more coming for Thursday. But here it is. Eiffel saying, I'm not sure why my liberal colleagues or what my liberal colleagues get out of behaving as though those of us who demanded the application of the 14th Amendment to Trump are naive or engaged in magical thinking. We know very well what this fight is about, and we know that no weapon in the fight against returning this authoritarian to the White House should be left on the table. Many of us are also the ones who will be at the forefront of protecting the votes of those most vulnerable to Trump's targeting. Give it a rest. Okay, good point. Of course, many people supporting the special counsel's prosecution of Trump in D.C. or Fonnie Willis's in Georgia or the 14th Amendment cases in Colorado or elsewhere are also going to be supporting political efforts to keep him out of office in the 2024 election. That there is such an overlap, though, should in no way mean that accountability efforts for past actions should be ignored or discounted. All right. Well, there's more from Chris, and we'll discuss it tomorrow, and more still uh, addressing the question of whether or not the third section of the 14th Amendment applies to presidents. I thought a very cogent and, and brief argument. I wish I had been had time to discuss it today, but stay tuned for it tomorrow, explaining one very good constitutional textual reason why that is nonsense. I, it's been brought up in the Colorado case and in, uh, well, in uh, various articles, but never quite so finely, I think, and so briefly. You have been listening to K-Grow in the Morning with David Waldman. All right, Justice Putnam is up next with his usual mix of stories from around the country and around the world. Let's see what's on top of his list today. Trump's violent rhetoric and call and response with his followers has led to scores of assassination threats in the last week alone against, guess who? The Colorado Supreme Court justices, but not to mention just them, but many more. Stay tuned for that story next.